But, you know, the, the lion's share of life is not amenable to being celebrated because it's not principally a, a cavalcade of upside. The majority of life is consequential without being necessarily beneficial in the narrow sense of that term. It's consequential, and, and you have an obligation to live out. Well, I mean, there's an old Provençal prayer that dates to, I think, 12 or 1300s, and it says it very beautifully. And it's once you've heard it, you tend to remember it because of its brevity and its clarity. And this is what it is. It said, God, help me. My boat is so small and your sea so immense. There. Everything's there. It's not asking for things to be different. It's not asking to be saved and removed and lifted up. Mm. It's asking simply to be helped because mm. the chances are not in our favor, right? It's a, it's an enormous circumstance, this thing of being alive. And to realize its temporariness is to be periodically overwhelmed. I mean, you grow accustomed, you know, being alive is a kind of habit forming thing. And it's very important to challenge the habit formingness of it all. Mm. Because what you don't want to do, and I, I can promise you this, because man, did I ever see it happen. What you don't want to be doing is entering into your dying time, petulant, miserable, haunted, mm. uh, grievance driven, uh, feeling betrayed, you know, these kinds of things, they have no place in a demise. I'm not saying that they're not understandable, but they're a consequence of the fact that you probably lived your life in a death phobic culture and you took your instruction and you took your example from those fears. And you thought that was life affirming by being all you could be. But death is not being all you could be. Death is the end of you. So it's very advisable to practice. There's a poet named Elizabeth Bishop who's from the Maritimes in my country, but grew up in, in the United States, so they claim her. But anyway, she's got a book, she's got a, a poem called One Art. And it begins this way. She says, The art of losing isn't hard to master. For everything that was made was made with the, uh oh, I'm blanking on one word here. Everything that was made was made with the intent to be lost. And so losing it is no disaster. Practice losing something every day. Not misplacing something. Losing for good. Look at yourself and say, baby, won't last. Enjoy your, your strengths right? In your range of motion, all of those things, that they belong to a certain time. And there will be a certain time where they won't come back no matter what you do. Mm -hmm. And you've got to find a way to not be, not to regard that as life betraying you because you are a good person. Mm -hmm. You see it, these two things that have nothing to do with each other, you being a good person, and the, the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune finding you, are not mutually exclusive. How That's how you find out about your goodness. How did we keep this morality piece without the spirituality piece? Like I'm really I'm lost on that because I feel like we have all of the morality of religion without any of the juice <laughs> sometimes. I don't know if that's an observation you share. But... Well, I, I think I understand what you're alluding to. It seems to me that um, I can tell you I've done a lot of interviews, as you may have discovered, like yeah. probably too many. Yeah. Yeah. And and a fairly routine question in the early days went something like this. So did you find in your time in the death trade that uh, dying people who had a, a kind of spiritual orientation to their lives or a religious affiliation or something like this had better outcomes? That's what they would ask me. Better mm -hmm. outcomes? You mean... An, an, like not dying or... <laughs> but anyway that, that's what you you know what they wanted to find out is there an upside mm. to going into the last round like that and i can tell you my routine answer was no 
There was no inherent benefit. And here's why. This is very, might be very surprising. It's because of the spiritual orientation, the spiritual practice, the wellness thing, whatever it is, whatever stripe it is, all of these things were undertaken covertly to contend victoriously with limits and frailties and endings. Mm. Boom. Okay. So this means that all the realities of your dying were your principal adversary or enemy mm -hmm. as you practiced being all you could be. Mm -hmm. And when it finally comes around, it's a complete and utter defeat, isn't it? If that's the way it's gone. Mm -hmm. What your spiritual practice should be, or at least include, I would say then, mm -hmm. it should gather around the things that you will not prevail over that's where it should go it should be you know deep long meditation of a i suppose the buddhists have this practice you know in their corner that they practice a, a degree of dying consciousness maybe we could call it that mm -hmm. uh, fairly that. routinely the and it's an understanding on yourself as dead is that the one i'm sorry could you say it again is it the one where you meditate on yourself as being already dead is that the meditation? I'm not that guy. So, you know, they oh, wouldn't yeah. have me, remember? So, <laughs> and not a Buddhist in, yeah, not nobody. Nobody would really have me, no. <laughs> so, I, I think at the end of the day, here's a, here's a question. It's going to sound simple and unnecessarily uh, bright, but it's this who dies? Answer is, only living people die. There's a lot to meditate about just in those two phrases. Mm. Who dies? Everyone? No. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? So there's an alternative. Sadly, there is. What do you mean sadly? Shouldn't we be celebrating the alternative to death? Not once you learn what it is. No. The alternative to dying is to die refusing to die. Mm. Nobody, nobody would want that if they knew what it meant for them. But many people died that way on my watch, I have to tell you. Mm. Yeah. I So that was the big thing that happened for me at about, I think I was in my mid-20s. Uh, I watched a man die who had had a hard life and a non um uh, like he'd not done, I guess, the work you're speaking of, of arriving at death in a place yeah. of acceptance, forgiveness, you know, um, and it was also a heavily medicated death because of um, cancer. And there was a lot of, you know, it was quite an awe-inspiring experience to watch a 64-year-old man cry to his mother, you know, in the dark of the night. <laughs> Um, even though in his like lucid state, he would say that he hated her and she was awful and all these things, but um, and beg for her to come to him. And it, but yeah, it was a really powerful thing to witness. And um, really? I still haven't kind of obviously <laughs> fully reconciled what that was, but I remember thinking, I do not want to go that way. Right. And um, that was what really started for me. I also, the same, about two weeks later, my aunt passed of a heroin overdose. So I had these two really. Yeah. You know, I'm going to be, be unconscious deaths and I'm using air quotes <laughs> because I don't want to say death is death, you know, but um, yeah, they were both really pivotal in sort of informing me to start to think more about what it might mean to die and to do so in a way where, hmm, yeah, where it's less medicated and less, um, <laughs> less painful and less uh, numb, I suppose, to, and I don't, I don't so know. Oh, yeah. These two examples that you've given us mm -hmm. are very persuasive on the following principle. This is the principle. How you die is not your possession. How you die has consequence for everyone around you that's mm -hmm. exponentially greater than the consequence it will have for you. You won't live the consequences of your dying. The rest of us will. Mm -hmm. The people around you will. We will be, well, I should ex exclude myself for obvious reasons.